Hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us today. I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar during Fair Trade Fortnight. Thank you all so much for, for attending uh, and thank you so much for, for our panellists who I'll introduce in a second. Um, before we get started, I just need to run over a few housekeeping bits. Um, we are going to be recording this session. Um, and also, if I can ask all participants, um, attendees to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to ask any questions. Uh, so the format is going to be roughly 30 minutes discussion with our panelists and then time for audience questions at the end. So please do use the Q&A function to ask your questions and I will get through as many as we can at the end. Um, so the focus of today's topic, um, as you are probably all aware, is the focus of this year's Fair Trade Fortnight, which is climate resilience. Um, we were going to hear today from our panel of experts on how climate change is affecting supply chains and what can be done to boost the resilience of small older farmers and workers who are already facing vulnerable um, working and farming conditions. Currently, farmers and workers are being hit on three fronts. Um, low global commodity prices, the global health uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and also unprecedented changes in weather patterns. This is really affecting farmers' livelihoods and abilities to um, carry on farming sustainably into the future. 2020 was globally the hottest year on record. Uh, and with that, we, we saw really uh, volatile conditions, including increased risks of hurricanes, droughts, floods, uh, and really weather patterns changing at, at quite an alarming rate. By 2050, uh, it's predicted by many experts that as much as 50% of the land currently used to grow coffee will be unusable to grow the crop, and that many cocoa growing regions in West Africa will simply be too hot um, to continue to, um, to farm cocoa. This is, this is really alarming for us and it is clear, sending a clear signal to, to everyone that, that now is the time to act and we need to be talking about what potential impacts these changes in climate could be having on the future of some of the foods that we love at the moment. The reality is that most farmers and producers simply don't have the means to mitigate against and adapt to these changing conditions. Their income levels are such that they don't have the ability to invest in climate friendly um, agricultural practices and, and they don't have the ability to, to change to the ever changing weather um, patterns and conditions. Higher incomes are a vital tool in the, in the pursuit of, of uh, changing the, um, the future of farmers livelihoods. We know that by empowering and enabling farmers through higher incomes, they're able to make really good investment decisions. When it comes to farming, the farmers and, and the workers themselves know what is best for their land and know how to invest um, the money that, that um, they receive through fair trade. Farmers need to be empowered to make these investment decisions and that's, that's what really what we're all about at Fair Trade. We want to see uh, the farmers and workers being able to take these decisions into their own hand to protect their own environment and to adapt to the changing climate decisions and really to ensure that they are able to continue farming for this generation and for future generations to come um, so that we here in, in the UK and, and uh, I can see that we already have some uh, attendees from other parts of the world as well, that we're able to continue to, um, to enjoy the products that we love at the moment. So the message is clear from Fair Trade: we need to act now, we need to come together, we need to find solutions together. This is not a single, uh, this is not a single person problem and, and no one person will solve this by themselves. But if we come together, we, we really believe that now is the time that we can make significant change. The fair trade minimum price is a great starting point for that, but we, we also call on, on our other actors and other tools at companies and, and uh, consumers' disposal to, uh, to make the difference and the change that we want to see. So without further ado, I will uh, actually, we, before I introduce our panel, we are going to uh, hear from our audience, please. Uh, so we're going to introduce a poll. Um, I'd like to hear from everyone what they think is the most important issues when, when thinking about climate resilient supply chains. So if you could just uh, select three of them and then we will, uh, I'll follow up on the results throughout the discussion and also we will send around 
um, the poll uh, afterwards as well. But yeah, it'd be great if, if we could hear from, hear from you all as to what you think the three most important issues are. I'll just give a couple of minutes. Okay, great. I will now introduce you to our four expert um, panelists. So first of all, we have Anne-Marie Yao. Uh, she's the regional cocoa manager at West Africa. Uh, Anne-Marie is affectionately known as, as Mama Coco um, by the farmers that she works with uh, and is responsible for um, developing and implementing Fairtrade's uh, cocoa program in West Africa. Um, she works with producers on market demand, um, on increasing volumes and creating lasting impact for farmers in their communities. Um, Anne-Marie is also the gender champion for the West Africa region and runs uh, the Women's School of Leadership, which was one of our flagship programmes sponsored by um, the Co-op and by Compass, which looks at uh, empowering women to have alternative skill sets. And next we have uh, Cheryl Pinto. Uh, Cheryl is joining us as the values-led sourcing at Ben & Jerry. She's joining us from Vermont. So thank you, Cheryl, and, and a special acknowledgement for the early hour that you are, um, that you are joining us. Uh, Cheryl works to advance the social and environmental impact across all of Ben & Jerry's value chains. Uh, Cheryl leads the partnership with Fairtrade International on the Producer Development Initiative, which is an innovative approach to empowering um, small producers and their investments. Uh, Cheryl currently sits on the boards of Divine Chocolate and Sustainable Food Labs, so well known across the sustainability sector. Our third panellist is John Steele, who's the CEO of Cafe Direct. Um, John is a business leader and social entrepreneur with a passion for making change and uh, business a force for good. Cafe Direct is one of the uh, UK's leading businesses in social enterprise and they played a pivotal role in the change in shaping the change agenda. In 2018, Cafe Direct became the first UK coffee business to be B Corp certified. And finally, I'll introduce Catherine Higgs. Uh, Catherine is the head of food policy at the co-op. Her and her team work tirelessly for, uh, on defining um, the strategy and implementations across a number of issues, including ethical trade, fair trade labelling, health, well-being, sustainability, uh, food waste, water. Yeah, Catherine has quite, quite the large portfolio of, of um, issues that the co-op are tackling. She has experience of developing, uh, developing customer-facing awareness programmes and community initiatives. She is passionate about understanding the is issues that citizens care about and supporting better understanding of food-related issues. So we will start with our questions. So first up for Anne-Marie. Hi, Anne-Marie. Hi, Kitty. Very nice to have you here. Uh, joining us from, whereabouts are you joining us from, if you'd like to let our audience know? I'm joining you from Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire. Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire. So welcome, welcome Anne-Marie. Um, West you, Africa has been identified as a uh, climate change hotspot. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what is affecting farmers uh, in that specific region? Thank you, Katie. And before answering the question, can you allow me to say something about Fairtrade Africa and also the West oh. Africa region and tell you a bit about how we operate? Uh, Fairtrade Africa is a producer network and we are owned by our members. And we currently represent more than 1,500,000 1, 1, producers across 33 countries in Africa. So our members produce export commodities like coffee, cocoa, corn, banana, mangoes, and other non-commodities products like sherbata. In the West Africa region, we have a key product, uh, cocoa, and we also have uh, bananas. And we record over, over 300 uh, certified cocoa organizations. And the West African region is composed of a big team of 30, uh, 31 people providing technical support to farmers and which represent approximately uh, 200,000 individual farmers. 
So in my role, I oversee the West Africa Cocoa Program and other cocoa-related projects. And since October 2020, I also represent Fairtrade Africa Producer Voice in the Board of Fairtrade Foundation. It's an honor to be taking the voice of farmers in this discussion today. Thank you again for uh, the opportunity. Then back to your question. Yes, uh, climate change and its consequences are being felt across the planet. It's not only in West Africa, we have it everywhere and uh, especially in the developing countries. In West Africa, we have recorded a longer dry season and less rainfall. Uh, there are new forms of pest disease. Uh, some studies uh, state that approximately 10 to 15 percent of uh, cocoa, uh, cocoa plants are affected by shoot and shoot virus disease in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And we are quite exposed in, in Cote d'Ivoire on uh, about this uh, Shaolin shoot virus. We also notice changing uh, uh, growing season for cocoa and also for food crop. And there are um, decrease on our yield, the quality is affected. Indeed, uh, temperatures and precipitation play a considerable role in cocoa production. It's established that extreme temperature adversely affect cocoa production. So yes, we have uh, we are we are really experiencing the effect of climate change. Uh, the increase on on temperature and the declining precipitation trend, I'm sure, and this is a fear for us, will reduce more and more cocoa output in the future. In Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, the current average uh, yield is uh, 40 to 50. Uh, uh, no, it's 400 to uh, 450 kg per hectare. It's very low. Why? Because uh, the farms are old and the climate change effect is rude. Uh, we also have the same thing on the food crop, which is also a very high risk in terms of hunger. So this is more or less how the, the big picture is in West Africa. And what, um, can I just touch on a, a, a point that you raised? What, what is the solution for the, um, the disease that you mentioned and the fact that that's affecting 10 to 15 percent? Is that, that that all of those crops need to be replaced by disease resistant variants or, or can it be managed? Uh, the Shaolin shoot virus is uh, a very uh, difficult uh, virus to, to deal with. Uh, most of the cases call for a rehabilitation, a full rehabilitation of the farm. Uh, so far, it's uh, the only um, mean to, to come across uh, this disease. And I, I can imagine that that comes at significant expense for the farmers. Absolutely. The above listed trend or the, the thing I mentioned, uh, reduce the yield. And of course, reduction on yield automatically translates into reduction of income for farmers and their family. And as you know, we have millions of millions of small, uh, small scale farmers in West Africa that depend on cocoa. And the majority of the cocoa is produced by small order. So we think that is huge to build our farmers resilience. And yeah, is the reason why we are happy and delayed to be a part of this discussion today. Great, thank you ever so much, Amory. That was really, really insightful. And um, Cheryl, we've heard Anne-Marie talk about the problems in West Africa. Um, how, how do Ben and Jerry's fit into that? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, first of all, for having me here, Katie. I really uh, appreciate being on this panel with uh, my colleagues. And um, it's, it's an interesting uh, discussion that you're opening up with Anne-Marie about the challenges around uh, rehabilitation and what's happening in Coco. So if I could take a step back. And, and just share a little bit about Ben and Jerry's approach to work and then dive into Coco. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know how many of your uh, attendees know, but Ben and Jerry's is an ice cream company and uh, founded in Vermont by Jerry and Ben over 40 years ago. And one of the key uh, operational models we introduced was linked prosperity. So we have a three part mission and we have linked prosperity. So the three part mission is basically making delicious ice cream doing it in an economically responsible way. And then we have the social mission, which is about the impact that we have on all those that are in our value chain and the communities where we work, where we operate. And so with this in mind about 
oh, 10 years ago, we'd made a decision that we would convert our entire portfolio to fair trade. And one of the key reasons for this was because farmers have a voice. They're at the table of fair trade with the governance model, which was really important. There are a lot of different certification schemes. There's a lot of different ways of um, really doing good in this world and connecting all the players in the value chain. And for Ben and Jerry's, having the farmer voice as part of the model was one of the important values for us. So in that spirit, when we did the conversion, we established a fund with fair trade called the Producer Development Initiative Fund, a little bit of a mouthful. And the reason this fund was really special to us was because it allowed us to go beyond the fair trade pricing, beyond the structure that's already in place with the network and to dive in deeply and establish relationships with co-ops to then at the table discuss what's important to the farmers and move towards that. So to pay additional investment in the practices and projects. And most recently, last November, we made a commitment to pay the living income reference price. So it ties to what Katie, you were saying about the incomes of farmers and what Anne-Marie was saying again about cocoa revenues. And for Ben and Jerry's, it's so important that along with productivity, along with diversification, along with the professionalization of the co-op, all those very important attributes that you have, price needs to be in there as well. Because again, tied to yield is the price so that you get the revenue you need for a dignified livelihood. So it's taken years to establish this. Five years ago, Ben and Jerry's, partnered with three, four co-ops right now, um, but three co-ops five years ago, we have four now. And so with the PDI, which we use broadly for coffee, tea, sugar, et cetera, we focused on cocoa and said, let's look at climate resilience, let's look at advancing living income, and let's look at cooperative strengthening. And then it starts with the co-op, and then we again work up the value chain to the point of industry influence. And it's been interesting watching how COCO has um, evolved in our strategy over the last five years, because there's been a lot of challenges. We, we knew climate change was having a devastating effect and is expected to be worse. As Anne-Marie said, we know that um, the cocoa growing regions are expected to shrink by one third over the next 30 years. So that, that's a tremendous change when you think that cocoa has grown around this narrow band around the equator, and it's been in play for so many decades, and now you're gonna see the shift. We knew about uh, swollen shoot, and it's been an interesting approach because the, the Ivorian government, for example, has also taken steps. So when it comes to the renovation and the investment that foreign companies can make, there's more, um, there's more structure and governance around this. So to support the farmers, we then lean into agroforestry. So we are leaning into the shade trees to support the cocoa trees, because again, there's, there's different rules and regulations around that. Uh, recognizing the shifts in um, precipitation, recognizing that the global north really is driving a lot of the climate change that the global south is experiencing, but still looking to introduce ways of um, mitigating the overall effects. So we're working with cook stoves, we're, we're working again with um, looking at deforestation. And again, more broadly, because of the living income, we feel that by raising farmers' incomes and revenues, it enables them then to address all the challenges in cocoa, child labor, the, the lack of succession because it's, it's a, a challenging livelihood for young people to go into. Uh, you really need to sort of make cocoa growing and being a cocoa farmer um, a role that's dignified, that provides the quality of lifestyle that so many of us enjoy. And so for us, the, the prime lever that we're pulling on is to raise the incomes for farmers. Because again, as Anne-Marie said, they know, and you said this as well, Katie, they know what they need to do on their farms. It's about providing the opportunity uh, to have the income, to have opportunities to invest in, and to have the support to make sure those returns on investment come through. You provide that full enabling environment and, and then you're able to actually succeed. But if you pull out any of those pieces, you're setting farmers up for failure and it just propels this vicious cycle. So our key role is to sort of try to flip it and do this with other brands and companies. There's so many that are in the same space trying to flip this into a virtuous cycle. Yeah, I think it's such an interesting point you raised about the interconnectivity of, of these issues. And, and yes, we're here today talking about climate resilience, but, but we could be talking about another issue which would, which would pull on, on matters of, of climate and income and, uh, and uh, sustainable livelihoods. So, so you're right, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a web of interconnectivity which we're all trying to, um, to find our path through. So thank you very much, Cheryl, for that perspective. Um, John, please could you tell us a little bit more about um, Café Direct's approach to climate change? Thank, thank you, Katie. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think uh, I think this is probably the most wonderful fair trade fortnight I've been a part of. Um, I, I've been a part of, a, of I've been doing this for nine years. So I've been I've been to a few of them. But I think what's wonderful about this one is your focus on um, the most important issue facing us, and the fact that you're really helping us to connect that to the livelihoods of smallholder farmers. And um, you know, I think for many years people could have been seeing things separately whilst you're bringing them together so powerfully. So I think that's um, a really good thing that Fairtrade are doing this, this fortnight. So it's so well done. Um, I mean, Cafe Direct, I think as everybody knows, has, has been 100% you know, committed to Fairtrade since it, we started doing that in 1994 together. And um, I think you know, for, for us, we, we see climate change through the lens of the smallholder farmer. I mean, the, you know, the, the, they, are, they are central to the solution and they're also being most uh, negatively affected by, as, as Cheryl suggested, um, the, the, the negative um, behaviors and impacts of other parts of the globe. So I think um, it's, it's very important to, to see it through that lens. And I think to em empower and enable smallholder farmers to step up and um, you know, ch change the, the landscapes and, and livelihoods that they have. I think, um, so our commitment to fair trade is, is, is there. I think the other thing that's changed significantly for us as we look to have a more kind of regenerative agricultural policy is our commitment to organic, which has been growing exponentially over the last um, six or seven years and is now you know, nearly at the same level as our 100% fair trade commitment. And, um, so I think you know, you've got our, our position on, on, the, on certifications and uh, on returning um, income to farmers. I think the, the other thing that we probably don't let people know enough, but um, is becoming more self-evident is, you know, genuinely putting smallholder farmers at the center of what you do. So, you know, we're, we're very proud to have, you know, board members, you know, members of the PLC board who are, you know, farming in both Africa and uh, Latin America. And to have set up 11 years ago, a, a charity run by farmers for farmers and to continue to donate to that and to in, increase donations from a number of different actors, um, which I guess is, is the point that I think Cheryl and um, Anne-Marie were touching on as well, is it's a collaboration. It is about us all fighting the biggest issue that we have to fight. And um, so yeah, no, I suppose we, we view it through the, 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 the eyes of the people that we're here to serve, which is smallholder farmers. I think that, that's great, John. And, and it's, it's so interesting what you said about um, we we have a tendency to put a lot of um, a lot of the burden of the solution of climate change on these small producers, and yet actually they are the the ones who are least contributing to um, to the overall global emissions. And it's a it's a, a hard position for us to be putting farmers in to say they need to be making changes when actually they have been contributing the least. Yeah, yeah, we could, we could talk about this for quite a long time, couldn't we? I, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, it's the, the, the kind of social injustice of it all as well. If you look at the, you know, the, the, the difference between smallholder farmers and, you know, who, who, upon whom we all depend upon, and then the, the behaviours and attitudes of those that are involved in other parts of the world. I mean, the, you could get quite cross about it, but I think what we need to do is we need to come together and take the kind of action that, that fair trade are trying to catalyze in, in this fortnight. So. Great, thank you ever so much, John. Um, Catherine, I have a two-part question for you. Um, firstly, if you could tell us a, bit, a little bit about um, what the co-op's position on climate change is. And then secondly, um, if there are any specific initiatives which the co-op are undertaking and to make your supply chains more resilient to climate change. Hi Katie, thank you for that two-part question. Well, I hope I don't get too excited about the first part and forget the second part, so do, do I'll remind you, don't worry. <laughs> um, so uh, just if I may, um, thank you for inviting me on the panel and it's such an honour to be with such, you know, leading people in fair trade. Um, I have to pinch myself uh, to be here. Um, so just if I may, just a very few quick points about the co-op. I hope most people know who the co-op are. 
Um, but if not, um, we are a, a business that has championed fair trade for over 25 years. It's something that um, as a co-op, our members are absolutely passionate about. And in fact, one of the things I'm most pleased about or proud about is the fact that fair trade was kind of brought to us by our members. They kind of went this, you know, absolutely chimes with your values, your principles. Why are you not behind it? And 25 years on, you know, we're really proud to be the kind of leading um, convenience retailer supporting fair trade. Um, and one of the retailers that, you know, that we believe kind of helped to mainstream fair trade, particularly in the UK when we put fair trade products in each and every one of our shops way back in 1998, which makes me feel very old because I do actually remember that. Mm -hmm. And so the first part of your question was around what's the co-op's position on climate change. So um, first thing I'd say is that at the co-op we recognised and started to respond to climate change a long time ago, 2006. Um, quite a lot of time really beyond before quite a few other businesses kind of really started to think about it. So as a result, we got a bit of a head start um, and we were able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from our operations uh, by some 70% since that date. Um, however, we now face uh, our next challenge and our biggest challenge really, which is a reduction of emissions from our products. The climate impact of our products dwarf those of our operations by at least 10, 10 times and is something that a lot of similar businesses will also, also have to face into. Um, at our AGM in 2019, our members took the historic decision for co-op to recognise the climate emergency um, and to commit to science-based greenhouse gas reduction targets and also to set a stretching net zero commitment and to absolutely take full responsibility for both our direct impacts and those from our products. Um, and basically that's what we've been doing. So we've aligned to net zero by 2040, and now we're working on our roadmap to reduction and elimination, working across the business with our suppliers, with partners, uh, all looking to address the impacts associated with our products. We've also been really fortunate to work with some great experts. So uh, a big shout out to the University of York, who we work with on a really exciting piece of work to understand and identify the risks, the climate risks associated with our key ingredients. Looking at not just the environmental risks, but also the human risks associated with those ingredients. Because here at the cult, we're really, really clear that climate change impacts people, not just the planet. Um, and how we're going to support those communities is absolutely at the core of what we do now and will be absolutely core to our future plans. And the second... <laughs> the classic on me. Exactly, I was waiting for it, I won't say it. Uh, and the <laughs> second part of that question is, is, is what, it's the, what are we doing? Um, so as I've said, you know, and others have said, climate change is real, it's life-threatening, climate volatility is affecting, you know, the foods that we all love and those that we all rely on, and farmers and growers um, in the developing world, the global south, are absolutely disproportionately affected by climate change. Um, and ultimately, you know, you can't hope to respond to climate change if you've got no certainty of income. It's just, you know, it's a no-brainer. Um, so for, for us, fair trade is absolutely key here. Um, you know, the minimum price that fair trade offers provides a safety net for, uh, for when prices fall. Um, and the premium allows farmers to invest in projects of their choice, which will also, which will naturally include climate um, resilience projects as well. Um, I've been really fortunate in my career to go out and visit um, producers and growers, some of whom have been in, um, in West Africa and other parts of Africa as well. Um, and I've seen communities that have been absolutely living on the front line of climate change. They are, they have been devastated by the kind of, you know, the, the weather impact. So I've seen farms, floods, uh, farms just swept away. I've seen homes, villages swept away and communities living with that and then going into drought when soil fertility is just massively impacted. You can't grow anything in, in compacted soil. Um, you know, so I think for, for, producers um, in you know in developing countries climate change is something that is absolutely real it's not something that you watch on tv it's not something that you see in a documentary they are living with it and it is getting worse um, so what are we doing well um lots actually uh, but a couple of things that i'll just call out are um we're really proud to be supporting the fair trade um fair trade africa 
Yeah, I'll get this wrong. Fair Trade Africa, East Africa Youth in Coffee Programme um, in a cooperative in our coffee producer community in Kenya, which I'm sure, given the opportunity, um, and Marie will talk about a bit later. Um, but we're also supporting fair trade um, smallholder banana growers in our supply chain as well with a program that I think is really exciting. It's a program to improve productivity um, uh, through air soil fertility projects, organic soil fertility projects. Um, and this has helped fair trade producers remain competitive. It's obviously, you know, we're in a competitive world because it's reduced their production costs, but it's also increasing their resilience to climate change because better, richer, more fertile soils can hold on to more water, um, which means that um, you don't have to irrigate as much, um, they are more resilient to drought, and also there's a, a, a double impact really in that because the soil is so fertile, you don't have to apply um, agrochemicals as well. So a really kind of double win project. Um, and I think I'll, I'll uh, hand, up, hand back to you, Katie. I could go on, but I won't. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. That, that was great. And uh, thank you for sharing that you have been able to visit some of these um, uh, some of these uh, growing regions. And, and uh, yeah, the challenge that, that producers face is, is real and, and happening now. We, we saw only last year that um, the devastating effect that Storm Etta had in, uh, in Latin America. And we, we had some producers that lost up to 70 percent of their crops just from one single one single weather. Um, event and the devastating effect that that can have. So thank you for sharing for sharing those insights. Um, Cheryl, you've already touched on this a little bit. Um, and what do you see the biggest gaps that farmers need um, to tackle uh, climate change? Um, I think I think you've already mentioned the fact that that, that Ben and Jerry see income as being a, a pivotal tool. So could you uh, explain a little bit more about that, and um, if you could elaborate on uh, the commitment that you've made to the fair trade uh, reference price? I'm afraid it's my turn to tell you that you're on mute. <laughs> I've just been saying that doesn't get old after a year, right? We still love to tell each other that. Um, so yes, uh, I was saying that I had um, teased what the main part of our strategy is right now, which is that it does revolve so much around the dignified livelihoods and incomes of farmers. And so uh, I think what we had uh, uh, approached was starting with the the typical way of approaching um, the challenges but is by looking at productivity and looking at diversification and looking at the professionalization. I like to say that it was a three-legged stool because we had the professionalization and we had the productivity, but you could not get that step up for farmers without the price. And so it's still a very pioneering phase for so many brands and companies that are looking at this because the whole idea of being able to pay a farmer the increase in price is meant then to go directly to that farmer. You see the impact in their lifestyle choices and you see that lift. So it's a lot of this is theory in some areas. And so this year and next year is going to be a study exercise that our team is doing with Fair Trade, with GIZ, with IDH. There are a lot of partners now that want to learn how is all of this going to work. And so we're going to look and try to better understand what that really means. And so with the four co-ops, we've got teams on the ground doing this evaluation because with the lessons we learned, this can then be expanded because our goal again is to take this beyond cocoa, take this to other uh, commodities that we have. And again, looking at living income and living wage for other areas of the supply chain. So in that space, we've we've recognized that with farmers having that income, they have that agency that they need to make the choices that they need. Because again, when you speak to farmers and, and like Catherine, um, we've had opportunities to go. And so again, I'm in Vermont, but I have a chance and I know some of the, the co-op managers, et cetera. Um, but on the regular engagements with the teams on the ground, you hear these different stories and it, it's a whole range and spectrum because you've got some very small farms, you've got, um, extra labor coming in from different areas. You've got larger farms, you've got the consolidation. There are a lot of different factors as I touched on before. And so I think what we're recognizing is there are going to be changes and shifts. Not every farmer who's growing cocoa now will be able to continue to grow cocoa over the next 10, 15 years. So how do we help to actually create the next livelihood? How do we actually look to be able to provide the resilience to that rural landscape? So is it another crop? Is it some, uh, processing is, is it a different version of value capture that continues to try to keep 
the um, prosperity in the communities rather than seeing this migration from the rural to the urban because as, as John and we all have touched on, we're all connected. It's a, it's a large collaboration because for some of us, we're thinking cocoa and chocolate's a luxury. And so there's a lot of challenges for a luxury that we all enjoy, maybe some of us too often on a daily basis, but it's also the rest of the food system. And so there's a lot that has to be tackled because it is all interconnected. So farmers, I think, whether you're a cocoa farmer, a vanilla farmer, a dairy farmer in the North, they're facing a lot of common challenges. So John also touched on regenerative ag and Catherine definitely talked a lot about the soil, which is another big area that Ben and Jerry's is looking to support by helping uh, provide the awareness and education, but then also the tools to be able to implement and then the resources to continue that. Uh, because again, it's about the health of the planet and it's our ecosystem, which again, grows the healthier food, which again, supports. And so for us, I think what we tried to do again was to provide the support resources for the farmers because they know what to do and it's just a matter of giving them what they need to be able to do it. And then ensuring that it continues. It's not, it's not just show up for a year or show up for a couple of years. You've got to have a bit of a longer track because this takes time, as we all know. Climate change took time to get to where it was, and now it's accelerating. And hopefully, again, we can flip that. But to be able to have that commitment to these farmers to stay and to be able to start to progress so that you build that momentum so that you can actually provide that independence and agency. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm actually going to revert to Anne-Marie to see. Um, Cheryl raised a really interesting point about um the kind of the the longevity of, of farming communities and the, the impact that the uh the changing climate is having on on the potential for future generations to to continue to farm cocoa and and the kind of the effects of migration to to larger urban areas um do you see that in west africa are you seeing do, do young people see cocoa farming as a as a viable future line of work okay uh, Cathy, thank you before saying any other words i would really want to acknowledge and appreciate our partners and what they have been doing so far um, i'm really 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 uh, happy uh, to 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 share our perspective and how we feel it how we receive all your commitment and your support we have been working with uh, uh, all of them, uh, with Ben and Jerry and, and with Co-op and Cafe Direct. And yes, your commitment is making a difference. And I want to say it before moving uh, forward. Uh, yes, uh, Katie, uh, you know, we have this climate change trend, but it's worsened also by other things like poverty, uh, taking uh, youth from farming. So, I mean, we have different aspects aspect to tackle uh, and the first one should be uh, the, the income after the income if the income is improved we will not have to call for youth to join it will be something systematic and we also need to make the, the supply chain attractive with different layer and different kind of activity where they will find themselves you know we have technology now and youth really are focused on technology and we have a lot to achieve with technology in cocoa so uh yes youth are not interested because they are not seeing a feature in the cocoa as it is currently cocoa work is a, a, a burden is is so difficult to work in a cocoa farm so after uh, eight hours of a, a hard labor you need to make sure that and and dream that your cocoa will give you a feature but if it's not the case of course migration will be part of our problem to solve uh, we have other training Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire like uh, the illegal mining coming so we have many 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 um, issues to tackle but everything will come with the income the improve of this income cocoa farm are getting and these partners already working with us are doing what, what is key for us. But as Katie said, uh, and, and as also uh, Sharon mentioned it, uh, before, having this farmer being part of the discussion is very important. Having them as uh, being part in the heart of the system because we know what, we, what is good for us and how we can tackle. But we don't have all the expertise, uh, then this can come from somewhere else, but we need to work together. 
and in a, in a very organized way to achieve uh, the goal. And youth have something to present, for sure. Great, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. And, and yeah, you're right. Um, uh, you know, you know, key cornerstone of fair trade is to have the producers um, uh, empowered and, and able to be part of the decision making and, and not uh, and not just to be the recipients of, of decisions made uh, in boardrooms. <laughs> um, uh, John, could you tell us a little bit about how the coffee sector has been affected by climate change? Because it is a another key commodity that really has the spotlight being shone on, on, upon it in terms of the viability of coffee farming under current um, climatic conditions. Thank you, Katie. I sort of feel like I need to get myself focused. I was too busy listening to these other great panelists and Anne Marie's fantastic words there. And um, I mean, I, you know, the the effect is 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 significant. I I was uh, recalling a moment when um, a, a, chap, a guy called Andrew from uh, Kenya explained that they'd found um, frost on on tea bushes in Kenya, which is not coffee, but it just it just brings it to life that the change is is quite remarkable uh, in, in, in communities, and you're seeing things you haven't experienced before, and trying to work out how to deal with them. Um, I mean, certainly in coffee, um, the, the other thing that we found is, you know, um, as a smallholder farmer, you're, you're, not, you're not isolated. You know, the, the effect on the climate is around you and is sort of omnipresent in, in the landscape in which you're, you're operating. So often it, it can be, the, the change can be affecting your, your farm and your livelihood. Um, through a different aspect of, of the landscape in which you live, and um, we we went we go to Peru quite a lot. We have you know a lot of a lot of our farming communities are in Peru, and um, in northern Peru, um, a big big example there was where the the coffee farmers on the on the on the hillside were being affected really by climate change being exacerbated by um, subsistence farmers higher up the hill. Um, you know, uh, needing to use wood from the forest. So you, you know, you, you got the impact not only of climatic change, but then you got it amplified by human behavior in the landscape effectively. And um, the, the solution there was actually to work, to help to change people, not in the supply chain's behavior and encourage them and incentivize them to re reforest the whole area. Um, but it was it was fascinating that it's important to remember it's not just about you know a farm in isolation it's about the whole landscape in which you're operating and um i guess it, it picks up on 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 the theme that i think fair trade have been very good at amplifying which is we're all in it together so you you, you, you can't look at one solution um but um you know there literally you know farmers livelihoods were getting swept away by the the rainfall that wasn't being prevented because the, the forest wasn't there. So I think um, you know, for, forestation, as we all know, is such a big issue. Um, the, 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 because we're, we're very um, committed to, to, to fair trade, I think the, the, the thing about this is it's, it's and I think Anne-Marie and your other panelists have touched on it, ultimately it, it has to start with income and it has to start with uh, enabling people through a fair, fair and um, sustainable livelihood. And I think, um, in coffee, the, the, the fair trade price has been significantly ahead of the market price, although in the last week, the market price has moved up and, and got, to that, got to the fair trade minimum price for the first time in a number of years, which is quite a relief. Um, but it, it's also about looking beyond the commodity. I think um, one of the farms um, in um, the middle of Peru in a place called Pangoa that we, we went to kind of we have these um, these centers of excellence where you know a farming community demonstrates how they can change the way they manage uh, their, their lives and their environment and then other farms we bring them all there to, to learn from each other and this farm that we saw um, about a year and a half ago you know the the changes they've made and they talked about over about five or six years you know they had um, an incredible vegetable garden that meant that they got income from vegetables in the, in the local community. Uh, they uh, diversified into fish farming. Um, 
because it's Peru also into guinea pig farming, which is an incredibly important uh, source of protein. Um, and th these kind of initiatives can just improve income. And also, I think a point that some of the other panelists made, it is about making an attracting, attractive business and life out of, um, out of farming. And um, that, that diversification, I think, can do that too. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to be done, um, but it does, it does start with in income, I think. But uh, anyway, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I've certainly said a few things. So. No, that's fantastic. Thank you, John. And actually, I think you may raise a really good point about um, the, the kind of role of, of individual businesses or, or individual consumers. And actually, uh, in a lot of situations, we're seeing that collective action is, is one of the things that is, that is really needed to make long term sustainable change. Um, which handily leads me very nicely onto my last question for Catherine, um, which is what what would you see the wider industry do and, and how, how do you think government and industry could come together to try and, and tackle some of the issues that we've been talking about? Okay, so I can't believe it. it's the final or nearest near the end of the panel. This session has been so exciting and interesting. Um, what do I see as the most important things we could do? I think I think the key thing to think about is that, you know, we have a moral obligation to act. This is, you know, this is an issue that's bigger than any of us. Um, the science is really clear and now the time is for businesses and for government to absolutely act. It's kind of, um, you know, follow the science, absolutely. Take action um, and show some leadership. Um, because to your point, it's only through us coming together and collaborating and cooperating for a fairer world that we are going to make a, a difference. Climate change for businesses and for governments even shouldn't be a matter of, of competition. <laughs> you know, um, the issues are too big. These are people's livelihoods. This is our planet we're talking about. You know, we should be working together on solutions. We should be set sharing what works. One of my bugbears, not around climate change, but around some of the other areas that I work in is that there are loads of little projects going on that are all in their own way really, really good. But actually somehow it's not really happened that we've kind of consolidated all that learning and brought it together and built scale from it. And I think that's what needs to happen now. Um, you know, sure, you know, sure businesses will always want to have something that they can talk about that, you know, that they can feel proud of and connect with their customers. But actually, we should find ways to do that between brands. And, you know, one of the things I'm really proud of, we've, we've collaborated with lots of our suppliers and, and um, both with um, with Cafe Direct and Ben and & Jerry's. And I absolutely believe um, that the only way we are going to make a difference is if we do more of that, more talking together more sharing learnings and just kind of getting on with it and, and doing something. Great, thank you so much for that, that final perspective. And, and that concludes the kind of uh, the, the questions that are coming from me for this part of the session, but we've had plenty of questions come in from our audience. So if it's okay with all of the panelists, I'm gonna dive straight into some of those so we, that we get some, uh, some answered before the end of the session. I should say, if you've asked a question and we don't get to it, we will uh, endeavour to send a, a response after this session. Um, the first question I'm going to, to ask to Cheryl first, but I would uh, appreciate everyone else's uh, contribution. And it's, um, how do you feel the role of uh, social marketing can help influence positive consumer behaviour along with policy change? So, so how, how, I mean, Ben and Jerry's are a fantastic example of, of using your uh, social platforms for kind of sparking interesting consumer debate, but how, how do you see that working? I think uh, one of the key pieces of this work is to drive connection between consumers, between the companies and brands, all the way down the supply chain, through all the players to the farmers, because there's such a disconnection right now with where our food comes from. And we hear this a lot, um, whether it's the younger generation, even, even older people like me, not everybody makes this connection of, uh, very few people know what a cocoa pod looks like, right? It's just chocolate as a bar you grab when you're at the cash out and you, and you chow down. So 
I think through social media, this ability to, to your point, spark that interest, but to drive conversation, drive awareness, and really bring that connection from fans and, and people, again, that are at one end of the value chain all the way down to the other is so important because as Fairtrade says, we're all in this together. And when you do that, you start to also recognize a lot of the externalities that are out there. So I was, I was thinking about what Catherine was saying about the moral obligation, which I wholeheartedly believe in because we are all linked, but there is also a very strong economic reason of why we need to be fully aware of what we're doing and the impacts we have because it comes down to resilience as well. And we've all had these scares and remember headlines where we're running out of cocoa or there isn't gonna be any coffee. There aren't gonna be any bees to pollinate. All of these things are so connected because we don't understand the web. And it's important to be able to alleviate um, the pressures on the value chain and raise that awareness because without that understanding and transparency, which comes through social media, social media has brought so much transparency to so many things. You need to have that so that, again, things are not operating in silos, but you get to that scale. Because it's, again, things can spin on a dime. And we've seen a lot of movements where they just sort of blew up suddenly within days or weeks. And now you've got real change happening because it caught that momentum. And that's uh, social media is that lightning rod that really drives that. So if brands use that, and not just brands, others can use this as well, but you drive that connection we could actually pivot much faster than waiting for the old stagecoach approach we used to have. And it was like the old telephone game. You've, you've got to do that. So, um, so that's, I think Ben and Jerry's has been able to capture this really well. And we're, we welcome partnering and working with others to do this because, you know, as I said, one planet, our home, and we have to, we have to rally together. I think that's such a great point about the, um, the immediate nature of, of, of social media these days is that these debates can be raised in a second uh, and can, uh, can attract uh, a kind of a, a very quick momentum, whereas traditional marketing methods, we, we would have been spending a lot of time trying to get these messages out there. So yeah, it's a, a really interesting point about how, how we bring together people at, at a moment in time to create um, real and, and, and quick change. Um, does any, do any of our other panelists want to add anything on this point? Otherwise, I, I have a, a question that's going in a slightly different direction. So anyone ha has any thoughts on, on uh, consumer influence, then, then please give them now. No? Okay, I will move on to my, my question of a different tact, which I'm going to put to Anne-Marie first. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has has obviously had a, a, a very uh, very real effect on uh, what it means to be a farmer and, and how farming can can take place and, and do you think that there is an opportunity for us to to use this moment in time to rethink um, fairness in in supply chains does does this does this moment are we able to use this as a, as a time to rethink how we treat others in, in the supply chain? Was muted. Yes, yes, Cathy. Uh, yes, I think addressing climate change shall be an important priority for all of us, the cocoa industry, farmers, small businesses, national government, origin countries, all of us. And um, when, uh, when you now think about how COVID-19 have made things difficult for farmers uh, because they were unable to sell their beans, so they are getting, uh, they are now becoming more vulnerable than they used to be. Uh, yes, uh, we need to maybe rethink our ways of, uh, of working and also maybe think about the interventions we want to do to bring on board. And this is where I agree with uh, Cheryl about how all those things should work, how we could collaborate better and how we can coordinate uh, instead of having uh, individuals uh, uh, implementing and trying to solve the problem and tackle it from their end. We really need to uh, talk together. We need to uh, um, assess the difference of context and then uh, come up with uh, uh, what is needed. Uh, but the good uh, thing is that it's not, it cannot be only for, for 
we as fair trade or our partners on the call or those who are not with us today it should be the broader international community we all we should be all concerned about it it's not only about we it's not about the west african uh, uh, cocoa farmers it's our responsibility and i really think that uh, a local global framework is needed we just need to have uh, a space to deal with the harmful practices in the sector. It will improve uh, many things, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And, and, and Catherine, interestingly, from um, the, in the co-op's last report, you had some, some interesting data which showed that actually consumers um, were, consumers were maybe even more concerned about um, their connections with other with community and, and with with producers and actually you saw fair trade sales kind of growing ab above the the market i think that's a really really interesting point to come out of this pandemic is that that maybe people are, f are feeling like they they want to be more connected and that they um they they have this kind of moral social ob obligation absolutely i think one of the things that's will come out of the pandemic and as you said has already started to come out of the pandemic is there's a realization of how fragile we are as individuals and how fragile and precious our world is um, and i think for many people that's making them think more deeply about the decisions that they make about their lives and um, how they want to live their lives and the types of food that they want to buy and the kinds of businesses that they want to buy from um, you know i would you know, I think coming out of the pandemic, um, this is going to give an opportunity for businesses that have really strong values and a meaning beyond profit to really connect more deeply with consumers. And um, I, I honestly believe that. Um, and, you know, I, you know, when I talk to lots of our customers and as I said, you know, I've been very privileged in the role that I've got at the co-op, um, but, you know, the diff, you know, what we buy in a supermarket when we are thinking of ourselves as citizens makes a difference. And, you know, it's ringing in my ears, you know, conversations with Anne-Marie when I was fortunate enough to be in um, Cote d'Ivoire, is growers just want to sell more product on fair trade terms because if they can do that, all the benefits that we've heard will be delivered onto communities. So, you know, it's the consumers, it can feel quite complicated sometimes, but actually something like fair trade, a really clear certification system that kind of indicates to consumers, buy this and you are going to contribute to something amazing is so powerful. And, and thank you, Catherine, because that is such an articulate way for us to, uh, to draw into our last minute of this webinar. I think you've, you've really summed up a, a fantastic um, end piece which I, I maybe would have would have delivered in in traditional circumstances but thank you that was um, so well put um, we have just got a minute left so if if the panel would like to give us their final 20 second maybe uh, if there's one point that you would like to leave with our audience today so uh, Cheryl I'll come to you to you first yeah, I, I just loved what you said, Catherine, and to build on that, I think when we recognize often farmers are, are told you need to feed the world. And uh, I think what we really need to recognize is that farmers need to feed themselves and their families. And so this income has to come. That is the priority to take care of their friends, their families, their communities before they need to feed the world. So by that empowerment, then we all we all survive and, and thrive. Thank you so much, Cheryl and um, John. Very difficult to try and maybe just say one thing. Um, I mean, I think from Cafeteria's point of view, clearly st starting and embracing and, and listening and empowering and working with smallholder farmers is, is paramount. I think listening to the conversation and seeing the chat, though, we, we need to get together with this. We need, we need to scale up. And I think um, we need to find ourselves working across um, the value chain and with, with partners like the co-op and, and Ben and Jerry's and with smallholder farmers because it's quite clear that we, we need to mobilize at quite high scale and you know possibly and it, I think importantly the, the, the COVID crisis 
demonstrates that mankind can do that and we need to get the same urgency and more with um with climate change so i'll, I'll stop saying stuff because i'm going <laughs> into a few seconds really but thank you for inviting me that's great thank you so much don and uh finally anne marie thank you Cathy. uh as a farmer i would like to say that uh, we really think that there is a lot to do and we uh, appreciate the long-term commitment because for us uh, it can solve something it can do a, a lot we really believe in partnership and so we encourage synergy of resource and expertise including research and development uh, on climate resilience and, and any uh, approach that can help farmers to address climate change so help, we need your support. You mentioned the capacity building need. Yes, it's a need for us. And we'll be happy to work with you uh, in a coordinated way to make sure that we, have, we, we build the future for COCO. Thank you for the opportunity and we are looking forward. Great, thank you ever so much. And, and again, I'm sure on behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank all of our panel members for, for joining us today and for the really insightful and uh, motivating discussion. I, I feel like I need to go downstairs now and have my coffee and think about the changes that, that we can make at Fair Trade, the changes that we can all bring together because I, I found that really inspiring. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, thank you very much to all of our audience members who have taken the time to join us today. Um, please continue to support Fair Trade Fortnite. Go to our uh, uh, the hub on our website where you'll find lots of uh, really interesting and fun events happening for the rest of the week. And um, we've just put up another poll um, uh, asking if if uh, there are particular topics that would like to be discussed at future webinars. Our next webinar is on the sixth of May. We'll send out details. And um, following this, we'll be looking at. Uh, the online retail trends. Um, so a, a very different topic, but how how you can uh, sell fair trade um, through retail online channels. And um, so thank you, thank you once again. Um, thank you for being part of a of, of fair trade fortnight, and thank you for continuing to to use your purchasing decisions to to make the world a fairer place and to support uh, farmers and workers to really empower them and, and enable enable farming to continue to be sustainable well into the future. So thank you all very much.